Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could you Can I just give her because I'm a very poor uh, you shoot back. Right? Shoot. Could you just say, uh, just to extend this a little bit and, and, and refocus it and, and sharpen it, what is experimental about what you're doing? In other words, both, I know it's a huge question, but just a quick potted sense of how you would, how you would define experimental in the context of your work. It's just experiments in the humanities, and both of you are, you're talking about measuring, you're talking about abstracting, you're talking about uh, building models, you're talking about generating analytic knowledge, knowledge that's, that's not visible at first. Uh, but I'd like to hear you both reflect for a moment about what is experimental about what you do. You go first. Well, as I use the term experimental philosophy, it's just doing, broadly speaking, real experiments to address empirical issues. So I've talked about uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Simone Schnall, uh, whose work on dirty pizza boxes. Uh, that's an experiment. Uh, and it has a very surprising finding uh, that uh, one's moral judgments on issues that have nothing to do with pizza boxes uh, <clears throat> are affected in systematic ways by the environment in which uh, those judgments are, are made. Uh, similarly, uh, some of the stuff on um, the moral conventional distinction and can you get uh, <clears throat> a notion uh, of the sort that Turiel and his followers were suggesting of uh, moral rule as a natural kind, all of that turns on experimental findings. And um, I guess the way I got, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I, at one point in my career, I had a sign on my door that said 10 years ago, I couldn't even spell cognitive scientist, and now I are one. Uh, maybe I should put a sign on my door that says 10 years ago I couldn't even spell experimental philosopher and now I are one. Uh, the way I got into doing experiments with, uh, preferably with colleagues who are methodologically better trained than I or with students who are better trained than I, uh, was there are lots and lots of empirical questions that desperately need answering to move debates in areas like uh, moral psychology, but also in epistemology, also in the philosophy of language forward. And sometimes I could find somebody in the literature who's done it. You know? So uh, work like Simone Schnall's or Dan Batson's, wonderful. Okay? I can sit back and be lazy and do what I've always done uh, and read other people's work and cite it. But sometimes, A, nobody had done it. And B, uh, although I'm a pretty gregarious guy and I go around and knock on people's doors, I couldn't persuade anybody to do it. And a after you know, uh, uh, saying to myself and my students for a number of years, gee, it would be great if somebody did this experiment. Uh, <clears throat> one of us, uh, I'm not sure whether it was me or Jonathan Weinberg or Sean Nichols uh, with whom we started this came up with the idea, well, we do the experiments. Uh, so if there are questions that desperately need answering and we can't, get anybody else to do the empirical work, we do it ourselves. That's what experimental philosophy is. It's just doing empirical work that's at least in part motivated by an interest in moving forward uh, <clears throat> uh, philosophical debates. Well, um, I've never done uh, the sort of things um, Simon was describing. In principle, there can be that. Bourdieu did them as the basis for the book on distinction. He went around and asked people questions, exactly, you know, what constitutes taste in a certain uh, space-time, and uh, so those have been done. Um, the use of, for me, the most interesting, the, the, the thing that's most interesting for me, but simply because of uh, the way I'm done, and that's why I liked uh, encountering network theory, is when you can do experiments with literary structure. So that's why I thought it was uh, um, revealing for me was really the first time that I could feel, okay, so this is a, is, is a model of a play, a novel, etc. I can pull out a character and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Because in a sense, this is what, it's certainly one way experiments work. You just change the variables. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this is something that we seldom can do, obviously. Historians seldom can do that. And network theory seems to offer a way of doing it. We're trying, but we keep going round and round on whether one can do the same with, uh, uh, with style. I mean, whether you can actually change the variables in the in, you know, style of a novel, a genre, a period, et cetera, et cetera. But so for me, an important aspect would be, would be that of actually changing variables and see what, uh, what happens. But, but in historical work, there are always obstacles to that. 
So it would be experiments with the structure of the works, however defined. I mean, networks is not the only way of defining structure, obviously. But uh, yeah. I think Devin actually had his hand up next to. Thank you. Um, this, this isn't, is strictly question. speaking, a, a question as much as an observation, but it, it picks up on this sort of recent train of discussion. Um, in asking, when Jonathan asked sort of about those, the diagrams that you both ended up with, I was really struck by the fact that brought together to discuss um, sort of the possible ways in which a scientific practice and empiricism can affect the humanities. Um, both of you seem to be, in those diagrams, working to reconstruct our disciplines within sort of an evolutionary space. Um, in the sense that, as I understand it in cognitive science, uh, to some degree those models are sort of justified by some as rooted in a model of evolutionary history and sort of um, those different faculties were sort of constructed over time. It's certainly, uh, when you were talking about um, the relationship d between disgust and sort of emotional judgment, that was definitely justified on the basis of sort of a more evolutionary argument. Um, and as I understand your work, uh, Professor Moretti, um, a lot of this modeling has to do with an attempt to um, ask how generic form can be understood on sort of organismic and evolutionary terms. Um, and without being terribly reductive about that, I find it really interesting that given the question of empiricism in the humanities, we turn to evolutionary models as a way of, of providing sort of a framework within which that can be practiced. Oh, well, David, let, let, let me just clarify uh, uh, um, one point, uh, which is that, although you're quite right that when I was talking about uh, disgust and uh, how it works, part of the story was an evolutionary story, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the big models of moral cognition uh, were never intended to reflect anything about evolution uh, and weren't supported by any evolutionary claims. Uh, a, a secondary project is to say, well, all right, if this is roughly the right story about our moral cognition, uh, then uh, since um, <clears throat> our minds clearly have evolved, uh, there must be some account of how it has evolved, and that's a separate sort of uh, a separate sort of question. But um, there was a. Um, I mean, I want to bounce it back to you because there was a sort of edge in your question, and I'm not sure where the edge is. At least from my point of view. Uh, the reason evolution uh, or evolutionary considerations, evolutionary uh, arguments and evidence uh, is relevant uh, is because the theory of evolution by natural selection is true. Uh, and any place we can glean truths that will illuminate the structure of what we now have, we should glean those truths. Uh, but it sounded like you were sort of worried about this as no, though, actually, as though you know, it was, it was <laughs> underhanded or bad. Not as much an edge as an advocacy on my part. I, I study evolutionary theory extensively. Mm -hmm. sort of, I, I promote this kind of thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, okay. I, I, mean, I couldn't agree more. No, there was one thing I, I, I wanted to add. That is to say, uh, well, in culture, but certainly in literature, there is also the alternative Lamarckian account. But no, there mm -hmm. is, this is not a blind watchmaker. There is a watchmaker, a writer, a playwright, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, over and over again, you can say, well, yes, the watchmaker made a plan for his novel, but then the novel was completely different from the plan. So, you know, the watchmaker that actually did the watch is, for all practical purposes, a different person. And, and the watch that was really made was made according to C. 